Looks like it's working. That's good. Well, thank you everybody for having me. Um, I hope people aren't too disappointed that I'm not Coda. I'm actually kind of disappointed I'm not Coda. Uh, I much enjoy watching Coda speak. Uh, he he texted me or emailed me about a week ago, two weeks ago, saying, "Oops, I double booked myself at COVID. I wasn't thinking straight. Can you fill in for me?" I said, "Sure. What are you doing?" He's like, "I'm speaking about exterior insulation. I can speak about exterior insulation." So I decided to come and give you a presentation on that. As I well, let me get through a few here. So first, a little bit about BSC. Um, we're a Massachusetts-based consulting firm. Uh, founded by Joe Stebrick. Done a lot of work on forensics, design reviews, construction administration, and research. So we've been sort of involved with all aspects of the construction industry for a long time. Um, one thing that I really want to highlight, though, is the research. There's been a ton of research that BSE has done, uh, most of it through the Department of Energy under the Building America program, that's been directly related to low energy use, high efficiency homes. Um, so that information is there on our website and very much encourage everybody to go uh, take a look. There's a ton of information out there. Oops. So I started thinking about this topic of exterior insulation and I realized that I am now one of those older presenters, though I don't know when this happened to me, it just sort of <laughs> crept up. I remember watching Joe speak and I remember watching some of my mentors speak and thinking they'd always come up and be like, I've been doing this for whatever years. And they brought up all these old photos of things and I'd always giggle a little bit. Now I realize, well, that's me. <laughs> and the other thing that I realized is that I've been dealing with exterior insulation since the very beginning of my career. So I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta. And my first job was with Alberta Infrastructure. And their design standards right off the top were exterior insulation on all their buildings. Now, this is Edmonton, nice city. That's what Edmonton looks like most of the time. <laughs> this is a cold climate. It's a very cold climate. If you're wondering where Edmonton is, because my wife when I met her, didn't know where Edmonton was. Uh, she's from Pennsylvania. It's in Alberta, and it's right there, latitude 53. Uh, it's one of the most northerly cities in the world. I think Stockholm is maybe further north than Edmonton. Now, the Alberta government also dealt with all government-owned and operated facilities throughout the entire province. So even though Edmonton's cold, you can see that there's still plenty of landmass north of Edmonton, and there are cities and structures up there. <clears throat> so because of this, we had to deal with condensation issues, um, unlike what anybody probably has ever had to deal with in this room. It was one of the primary things that was of concern with our buildings. Um, their design standards, when I got there, was all ready to do a fully adhered air barrier. There was already exterior insulation on their buildings. There was no cavity insulation in these walls. <laughs> Everything was for rain screen cladding. There was no barrier system claddings. And we were definitely focused on uh, thermal bridging issues. And uh, as I mentioned before, condensation was one of the primary things that we were concerned about. Hey, just for some context, excuse me, what, yeah. what year was this? Because I'm going to be oh. honest, you don't look much older than that picture. That you <laughs> 1998. Okay. Okay. Is that a beer tag? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, I guess I skipped over this a little too quickly. Um, that is a toilet seat. <laughs> and it says engineering iron ring on it. So as a Canadian engineer, I got an engineering iron ring. And so the guys at the Alberta government, when I got my iron ring, presented me with this it's wonderful award. <laughs> award that they all signed. Um, actually, just so I also should say is that when I started, I was a co-op student. I hadn't even graduated from university. I graduated the next year, and they ended up hiring me on full time after that. Um, that is also not a beer keg in the background. That is my parents' piano. <laughs> 
right. Now that we got all that out of the yeah. Yeah. Yes, I can. So these were details that were developed back in 1998, 1999. Um, these were the standard construction details that were being used for the Alberta government. You can see quite clearly that we, you know, the exterior air barrier, the insulation. Now I know this might not seem that, you know, fantastic given that it's 2024 and most of our buildings are, are now being built like this. But this was 26 years ago, and this is what I was stepping into. Now, keep in mind, this was the Alberta government's standards. And there were some very smart people at the Alberta government, uh, Chris Makepeace, Barry Dennis, that were driving this. This was not Alberta construction standards. We were still back in the you know, polyethylene, ins bad insulation, metal stud walls thing. We had to fight with architects all the time to get them to design the buildings for the government to meet these standards. And I did actually have one uh, funny story about an older um, architecture firm where the guy that I kept dealing with, he kept sending me drawings that were not right. And we would argue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then one day he sent me a set of drawings for a new building and it was perfect. I have never seen a more perfect set of drawings. And I called him up and I said, what happened? Like, what's going on? It's like, well, the principal in charge retired and he no longer kept telling me, he's like, no, I know how to build buildings. I've been building buildings for 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> I kept shoving it down his throat. So he was getting yelled at from both sides. And eventually when the guy retired, he was like, fine, I can just <laughs> design. Uh, some just a couple other details for like base of walls. You can see here, the masonry relieving angle already, you know, stood off from the from the foundation to allow the insulation to be continuous and continuous insulation on the outside of the, the foundation. Okay, so the benefits of exterior insulation are a big part of it is for condensation management and that's great, but there are a lot of details that you do need to be aware of when you're doing this. Uh, the insufficient insulation, it wasn't so much of a concern with the Alberta government because those details were only exterior insulation. There was no cavity fill. But if you do put bat or any kind of cavity fill insulation in that wall, you have to be a bit concerned about whether you have enough insulation on the outside to manage the condensation. Uh, outward drying potential. A lot of the insulation products we put on the buildings are vapor impermeable or near vapor impermeable, and they can cut off any kind of outward drying. Uh, thermal bridging, thermal uh, continuity, and something I'd call cold fins or concealed spaces, which I'll get into in a second. All right, so a wall with insulated sheathing in the winter. The in idea here is that if the surface is kept warm enough, that you will not get condensation on the back side of that. And so what you're looking for is this temperature surf in here when you're looking at the thermal gradient through the wall assembly, that this temperature ends up being above the dew point temperature of the interior air. Now, this where is the dew point thing that goes on? Um, while the temperature may be somewhere in the middle of a wall assembly, that is not magically where condensation forms in the wall assembly. You need a surface for the uh, for the moisture to be able to uh, condense onto. You need something with some mass that's able to transfer. Uh, change the phase of the, the moisture into liquid. So while the temperature, the dew point temperature in this example is somewhere back here, the actual uh, condensing surface is on the back side of the sheathing. And here's a photo of that insulation that's completely frozen to the back side of some OSB <laughs> sheathing. So because of this, this is where you would see that accumulation of moisture and typically where you would see the damage. This was interesting. So this is actually, I'm skipping ahead a little bit outside of the Alberta government to when doing some research with, with BSC. Um, they were, we built some test walls 
to measure what would happen in terms of condensation resistance and drying ability of wall assemblies in a cold climate. So this is climate zone 6A. So it's cold. And the three wall assemblies, one has just paint on drywall with some XPS insulation on the exterior. Another one has paint as a vapor retarder or, you know, um, minimal vapor retarding. And then the last one is a polyethylene wall. They ran it at 50% relative humidity, which is admittedly a high humidity. We're trying to like overly stress the walls and see what was going to happen. So for the two by four wall with the one inch XPS, there wasn't quite enough insulation from the code ratio that we were looking for. It was a little bit less. And what ended up happening is if you look at the moisture content, these lines show the moisture content of the sill plate for the wall, so the polyethylene wall, 10%, pretty dry. One with paint, you can see some spiking where some water's happening. And then the XPS wall, which theoretically should be the safest wall because we should be resisting the condensation, had this massive jump in moisture content that was going on. In this, so when they pulled it off, you could see that this was all soaking wet at the bottom. And the reason why that moisture content went so much higher than the other wall assemblies is because there was two factors. One, the XPS was not vapor permeable, so it was not able to allow that moisture that was condensing on the backside to continue to dry through the assembly. And two, it was also not absorptive. So the water would collect on the backside, but it couldn't get absorbed into the material. It built up enough moisture and then drops down. So all of the collected moisture ended up concentrating at the sill plate instead of being more distributed through the rest of the wall. I know it's fun when, you know, science shows, like tests shows what you already know is gonna happen. Okay. That's what happened. So in the code, there are, um, some levels that you need to be following in terms of the amount of exterior insulation compared to the size of the stud wall. Now, this is not the energy code. This was done for condensation resistance. So don't confuse the two. There's the energy code requirements. And then this was for what kind of vapor retarder class you can use. So you'll see for um, insulating sheathing, at least two and a half inches over a two by four wall and two by six wall. This is all great if all you're building is two by four and two by six walls. And I've always argued that we didn't do this the right way. Yes. Um, are those walls insulated? Yes, those would be insulated walls. Oh, the insulation is what you really- Right. So this is really the table that you wanna focus on, which is when you're looking at the percentage of exterior insulation, compared to which climate zone you're in. So what this is telling you here, that for a climate zone five, you want at least 28% of your total R value to be exterior of that sheathing to avoid the condensation. And you can extend that, right? So if you start going to bigger um, stud walls, if you maintain that re relationship, that ratio, you won't get yourself into trouble. Is this assuming wood stud walls or metal, or does it affect it? it? It doesn't affect it, whether it's wood stud walls or metal. It's more, it's all about the R value of the insulation. So what it's looking at is it's going back to, uh, maybe that's a little bit further back than I thought, but this. This is a dimensionless drawing. So this, R value, if this was represented as R value, not thickness, that you would need the 28% has to be here and the bulk of it to be there. You could make both of these layers grow and be bigger. Like it would be like two feet of insulation and a foot of insulation. But as long as you maintain that same ratio of exterior insulation to the interior vapor permeable insulation, then you'll avoid that condensation problem. <clears throat> Is there a point at which they overlap? Say you have 
no exterior insulation, but a lot of interior insulation as you get. So yeah, so if you're in the all interior insulation, no exterior insulation, you're at greater risk of condensation. As soon as you get to that minimum ratio of 28% to the rest on the inside, that's where you're in a safe zone. Now, the nice part is you can go as much as you want on the outside. So you can go 50-50, 75-25, you're all safe, as long as you don't go less than the 28%. So that's why I was saying earlier that we weren't that concerned in Alberta because all the exterior, all the insulation was exterior. And that was purposely done to avoid any kind of condensation problems. We were dealing with hospitals and museums that had high, you know, interior relative humidities. And we want to make sure it was safe. Yes. If um, somebody's running a two by six wall with a one inch rigid exterior and closed cell on the wall, would ah. you still be worried about condensation going through that closed cell and condensing? No. Does... No, not worried about that. However, that kind of an assembly, though, if you were to get a leak into the wall assembly, um, you have very little drying either direction. Because now you have an impermeable sheathing. If you're using XPS, you have an impermeable sheathing on the outside, and the closed cell is also going to limit the drying on the inside. So there's that's a that's a different topic of, of conversation. Um, but yes, from a condensation perspective, that would be a fairly a, a safe uh, assembly. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about here, I don't know what this line is. <laughs> I thought it was a dupe line. Did I? Did I? It might have been when you were scrolling backwards with the slides accidentally. How do I get rid of that? Hey. We can live with it. Okay. <laughs> If anybody knows what that is and how to get rid of it, let me know. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about, about was the cold fins and concealed cavities. And what these are, are areas of the building that are separated from the mass, like the main interior mass of the building. So good examples are like canopies, parapets, pilasters, these types of things. The amount of times I've seen a canopy drawn, it's like 10 feet deep, or 10 feet long or you know whatever and then only about a foot deep and the insulation gets drawn all the way around this thing and the air barrier gets drawn all the way around this thing it's i i would make a fortune if i got paid every time i saw that it happens all the time to another extent we would have something like the um a parapet where it gets up insulated up and over now the problem with these types of assemblies is that there isn't enough heat getting to the space compared to the amount of heat that's able to get out of it. So even though it's insulated, that the fact that you have so much area, it loses heat at a faster rate than the heat would get into it. So that space is going to get cold, regardless of the amount of insulation you put in it. It just doesn't. It's kind of like, you know, having fists in your mitts versus your gloves on a really cold day. The fingers get cold. There's too much area and not enough heat getting down to your finger, right? So we want to avoid that. Right. Uh, hmm. Somebody fixed my yeah, that line, but now. Can you do the, just the arrows? Oh, yeah. there we go. I think that worked. So the intent is, let's try to separate these overbuilds from the rest of the building, keep the insulation, keep the air barrier in a straight line, just enclosing the mass of the space and those extra fins and, you know, protrusions you want to put to the outside of that. So here's an example I was mentioning of a canopy. Instead of wrapping this whole canopy, we just want to bring the insulation air barrier down. We have a steel penetration through here to pick up the structure going through. But we're not connecting the space. Similar, this is the detail I showed earlier with the parapet. 
how the air barrier and the insulation is going through this parapet, not allowing that end space to get um, any kind of air or moisture up into it. Peter? Yes. Do you find it necessary to thermally break that those structural elements like using is it necessary plastic uh, structural plastic coralaf shim? If everything you can do to help with the thermal bridging is a good idea, um, the first thing to do is just minimize them. And then if budget and you can convince structural engineers and builders to do things beyond that, then I, I applaud you. It's been 25 years of trying to convince people to do a lot of things and it's, it's not always possible. Um, so you kind of pick your battles, but yes, uh, I have been on some projects where we've done like a thermal break where we'll have the steel plate come to a plate with like a neoprene type spacer and another plate to pick up the rest of it and bolted connections. And then you've got to make sure that that gets buried within the insulation so that you're not short circuiting that thermal break. Some kind of a break pad or something like that. What's that? Some kind of a break pad or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's, that's that right. sounds, I yeah. think that's right. That's yeah. Right. Um, Here's just another fine little point about the continuity in, in thermal bridging. We talked about the insulation running through this parapet here, but where this parapet hits the wall, the insulation needs to also turn up that wall. So there's these small details that we were really focused on with, with the Alberta government of making sure we got all these you know, continuity areas to avoid having that uh, potential for condensation within the building. Um, the last one I want to bring up here was a classic uh, parapet with a curtain wall. This type of assembly gets built quite often. Usually this wall gets shoved pretty close to the, to the back of this, and we end up with condensation in this little void. You can mitigate that by actually opening that up a little bit and allowing more heat energy to get in there, but that's only good for low humidity buildings. If you end up with a high humidity building, we actually want to break that curtain wall at that point. And there's a, we developed a detail that we put another base plate and extended the volume of the curtain wall up. So you could actually have a full air barrier go through the curtain wall system and insulation without having to lose the appearance of that curtain wall going full height to the parapet. So the key takeaways from this was that, you know, too thin, of insulation could be a problem or not following that ratio. The rigid foam insulation is gonna be a uh, low perm. So outward drying could be impeded. If you go with exterior insulation, like a mineral fiber, that is a much safer option um, because you will have the benefit of having the reduction of the uh, condensation from warming the condensing surface, but also the added benefit of still allowing some drying because it's a vapor permeable insulation to the outside. Yeah. Sorry to ask so many questions. No, um, good. If you use a uh, vapor impermeable air barrier, like a pale Well, that takes away the drying as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so you're, you're suggesting use a permeable air barrier if you can. I would suggest using a permeable air barrier. And mineral wool. And I would also float this out there that I don't, I can't think of a situation right now where an impermeable air barrier is going to give you much like a, a big added benefit than a permeable one. So generally I always spec a vapor permeable air barrier. And if we have mineral fiber insulation and we're allowing that, that drying, even if you had a vapor permeable air barrier and impermeable insulation, we have found that with small spaces, you often will get the moisture to go through the air barrier, condense on the backside of the impermeable insulation, but now it's outboard of the water control area. Yeah. What about using XPS on below grade conditions? Perfect. That's fine. Yeah, because it's wet all the time. <laughs> okay. It's just wet. Yes. So what how what do you consider the perm rate or permeability of zip wall to be? Oh, I can't. I don't remember what that is off the top of my head right now. Um, I think it's pr it's fairly low. Um, it's a little bit lower than regular OSB, I believe. My understanding is that the the OSB component is permeable when it's wet. They say, 
and that the coating itself has a very low firm rate. So I think the combination of that. Yeah, it's a uh, zip guy in the room here. Oh, there we go. There's <laughs> always one. So the the permeability of OSB or plywood, my understanding, once again, I'm not a building, building scientist, but plywood OSB has a firm rating about 0.5, Um The overlay on the zip has about a, anywhere from a 12 to 16 perm rating. And then also the zip bar would increase that perm rating by a couple of points as well with the insulation. So how does it how does the insulation increase the perm rating? Decreases. <laughs> Deep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh should yeah. should should so, decrease it. Yeah. So, um oh okay. go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the other thing I would like to mention is that the difference between OSB and plywood is that plywood, when it gets wet, its permeability goes up quite a bit, and OSB's permeability stays fairly flat. Um, so, sorry to say this, but plywood in general is a little bit safer type of sheathing to use. It has a better redistribution of moisture and, and drying when in, in when and if it gets wet. So, can I say something here? Yes. So, um, I am a big proponent of... Um, impermeable uh, control layers to the exterior and impermeable insulation and all transparency. That's what I represent and sell. Okay. Um, and so I have to say, you know, a couple of, couple of things, you know, a, a bit problematic with this is that you can absolutely successfully and, and efficiently detail a vapor impermeable exterior and simply using vapor permeable exteriors do not eliminate problematic detailing and construction methods. You know, that's important, important to know. The other thing is that if you have exterior vapor drive, you have to then realize that there is going to be a moisture load on the sheathing and sometimes it's OSB. And what we find with real-time moisture monitoring is that it could be 50 plus percent of moisture load on um, some of these OSB sheathings and they were never designed to take on those types of moisture loads. And then there's also the inward solar driven vapor drive in in those cavity type right. uh you know class. I, I i guess i should have my my caveat should have been mace or like reservoir claddings with the inward vapor drive um because that is that is something that could be impacted so um having xps insulation behind you know a masonry veneer would be potentially safer but it all depends on the full analysis of the interior environment, the exterior environment, and, and everything else. Well, like so it, that's why Building Science Corporation has a great piece on the website called The Perfect Wall. And mm -hmm. you know the concept of The Perfect Wall is that those types of assemblies can be used in any climate zone. And um, Right, and they generally do not have any insulation on the interior of the stud walls. Which would be right. fantastic with us. And, and another, another well, thing is that there's, I, there's I, more I, I get you. Extruded I get you. polystyrene for the exterior. There's also polyisocyanurate. It's very effective to the to the exterior. So I listen, I'm not I'm not pushing one insulation product over another. Yeah. Um, the the reality is is that we build typically where we're going to have some insulation in the walls, we're going to have some insulation to the exterior. Um, when we get to more commercial buildings, we start seeing more insulation just on the outside. Um, if you were to have a condition where you get a little bit of water into a wall assembly, and this doesn't have to be just from a vapor drive, it could be from a leak, having a flow through assembly that allows you to have some drying inward and outward is going to be safer, and we've studied this, than it is if you have impermeable assemblies. Now, that being said, the level of increased, you know, safety is not so much that I would say like, oh, you should never use XPS insulation or you should never use a vapor impermeable water controller. Like, but in general, as a as an overall, you know, if you want if you want my safest assembly for most climate zones and most areas, having a flow through assembly that allows some drying and good air tightness and exterior insulation would be what I'd be recommending. What's yeah. the bigger hazard? Uh, infiltration of water from rain and weather from mm -hmm. outside or from condensation coming from the inside? What's the bigger of those two? What's the, the bigger of those yeah. two? Uh, the thing that's going to potentially cause more damage is a water leak. Right. Yeah. That's uh, so a lot of a lot of these WRBs and so forth are based on keeping the water. Well, open. yeah. So, but here's. 
this is my counter argument to that one is that I'm not going to design a wall assembly. And, and this came up in an expert session about five or 10 years ago, where they were talking about risky assemblies. And one of the things they brought up was like, oh, it's not going to dry if there's a water leak. I'm like, if there's a water leak, then all bets are off. Like this isn't, this, we're not building wall assemblies so that we can let them leak everywhere. We should be proper detailing to like stop them from leaking. But, you know, it, there are slight things that we've seen that allow, you know, we know that having some additional drying on a lot of these, these types of assemblies from condensation is helpful. And that same code that I talked about where it was showing um, the amount of insulation you could put on the outside of a building to help control the condensation. There's also another part of that table which talks about if, you know, you can go to a lower vapor retarder on the interior if you have a vapor permeable cladding and back vented or vapor permeable sheathing and a back vented cladding to allow for the drying. And this is the other part that we've seen from, from research. Um, I just recently was part of uh, reviewing an, um, a, a building failure. This is somewhat, somewhat off topic, but kind of related where we had a parapet that got built back over top of the roof and it was a, a building return. And I'm sorry for all the people online that cannot see any of this, but um, half of the parapet was fully roofed over and the other half was roofed up the backside and then had Tyvek and cladding on, on the front of it. Where it was fully roofed over and there was no drying for that assembly, everything rotted out within about five years. Hmm. And it was a, it was a, a kind of a kicker shape. It was like a triangular shape. So we could cut a hole and I put my head in, I could look down the construction. And as soon as we went from where it was roofed on all sides to where it was only roofed on one side and had Tyvek and was allowed to, to dry out, everything was pristine. And it was almost like a direct line where rotted to fine. So the abilities and allowing some drying from assemblies I don't think it's something we should like ignore. I think it's important. Um, I think it does reduce the risk of some of these things. I think more fundamentally proper detailing is more important than trying to say, well, we don't need to worry about that because our walls can dry. Does that, does that sound all right? <laughs> we're gonna move. We're gonna move on to uh, the next stage, which is 2005 to 2015 is when I left the Alberta government and I came to Building Science Corporation. I like the graphic. <laughs> this is actually a photo of me just before I crossed the border. <laughs> and, uh, you know, given a little, should I actually cross the border and, and do this? <laughs> so once I once I moved over here, um, the first thing that I really started working on was the research with the Department of Energy and the Building America program, which is a lot more residential based and less commercial based. And one of the things that came up right away, and I think it's been important for a lot of people, is cladding attachment over exterior insulation, particularly thicker levels of exterior insulation. And part of what I was tasked with was heading up a lot of the research on, you know, can how do we do this? We need to be able to do this. We need to be able to do this um in a way that is going to be low cost and easy to build and this is residential construction like home builder construction if it costs money or if it's hard they don't want to do it so that the only way to kind of push this into the industry was to find out ways that this could be done with readily available materials and easy details so some of the limitations that we had were that you know, typical framing nailers and things like that had a limitation to the length of the fastener that they could use, um, which meant that once we got to, you know, over two inches of insulation, being able to get embedment into the structure with a pneumatic nailer for like direct attachment of siding, it just you couldn't do it anymore, right? We just didn't have long enough nails and people didn't want to in production to start having a hand nail, you know, like six inch nails through the siding. Um, so, there was a sort of a switch between like, well, once we get to an inch and a half, we're going to switch to a different cladding attachment method. It had nothing to do with the fact that we couldn't technically, you know, just attach the cladding straight through the foam. It was just practically we didn't have the, the ability from the what was available in construction. So this was the, the intent was to put the insulation up, attach the insulation with wood furring strips, and then hang the cladding off of this. 
Now, Joe got a really good head start on this with his own house and barn. He decided to do this, but with eight inches of foam. Um, <laughs> the story goes that the eight inches of foam, he got it, I think he got it from like a highway reconstruction thing, the <laughs> EPS foam that came in like massive eight inch slabs. It's like, oh, let's just do that. So he, he attached it and that house had was built and had that insulation on it for 15 or 20 years. Everything was totally fine. So he knew this was going to work, but we just had to be able to prove it to everybody else. So we had lots of practical experience with this with lightweight claddings from like um, lap siding, fiber cement siding, but there was a lot of question about heavier weight claddings. And we definitely had a lot of resistance from the industry. Um, one of the big questions they kept saying like, oh, the, you know, the insulation is going to crush or it's going to sag over time. Those were the two main things. We don't, we don't trust this. It's, it's all going mean, to, I feel like they thought the cladding was just going to slowly slide off the building and just like fall down at some point in time. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what was going on in people's minds, but so some of the things were the insulation, um, does it crush under the load? Well, sure, it'll crush under load. Um, but if you load it to like 500 to 1,000 pounds per screw faster, it'll crush most rigid insulations. But that's not the right question because what we're looking for is does it crush under a load that we're expecting to put on it, right? We're, we're not hanging cars off the side <laughs> of the building. We're hang, hanging wood siding or fiber cement siding. So the context was important in the question. And so here's some typical cladding weights, um, pounds per square foot for vinyl, very, very light wood, um, just a little bit heavier, fiber cement can be a little bit heavier. It's not until we get into the stucco and adhered stone veneers where those types of weights start becoming more problematic. Um, let's see, and the, so this is just the same table, but now based on a per fastener weight, in, based, um, assuming like a 16 on 16 center for fastener. Okay, so we had to figure out like, well, what is an acceptable deflection? Okay, but when, that was the first question, like, well, how much can it move? What's acceptable? 16th? Sure, let's go with that one, right? <laughs> Um, and so we started doing a lot of research. We started in 11, 2011. Uh, we spent on some previous research and we took it into two main sections. One was just trying to understand the mechanics of what's going on with this. And the other one was to do a longer term environmental exposure because how else were we going to be able to address the creep issue other than having it installed for a while and monitoring it? So the um, we built these walls uh, in the laboratory using wood furring strips attached through the insulation and started loading them and measuring the deflection. That's basically how this went. What we found is that the insulation type was not really that big of a deal um, and that the system capacity really could come down to the number of fasteners used. There's a nice correlation for that. And we had really, really good performance and stable performance when the environment was controlled. So here is kind of a graph of some of the, the deflection charts. You can see that depending on, you know, when we had eight inches on center for the fasteners, they got more capacity, 16 inches on center for the fasteners, it was less. And then, you know, 24 inches on center was less. But when you normalize that, on a per fastener basis, all of a sudden, all that testing really kind of snapped nicely together. So it was fairly convincing for us that this really came down to specking how many fasteners did you need to support the loads. So the way the system works, there's sort of three different things that are going on with it. One is a rotational resistance of the fastener. Um, then there's also uh, what's called a compression strut, where as the faster rotates down, it pulls the furring strip in and tries to squish the insulation. And the last thing is there's friction between the layers. 
So we did some individual screw bending tests to see what the capacity was for those. I'm just gonna, I think I'm it's probably going pretty long right now. You're okay. Okay, okay. so um, what we're finding that if you did a single bending, the capacity wasn't so good, but we knew that the furring strips held the shaft of the screw kind of perpendicular to the wall. So you actually had a double bending in the system. So if you look, it's, it's more like this lower graph. And when you have a double bending like that on the screw, you end up with about four times as much capacity for that screw as you would for a single bend. So you can see the difference between the, the, the two lines from a single bending test to a double bending. The next thing we did was take a look at friction. Um, so in this case, we couldn't put any screws into it because we couldn't have any um, impact for that screw. We really wanted to isolate just the friction. So what we did is we actually tested how much uh, compression we got in the system by using an impact driver to install the insulation. And I think we found it was about 150 pounds of force. And so then we put the wall on its side, put 150 pounds on the top of the furring strip to act as that, that uh, compression and then measured the, the friction on it. Yeah. Um, And then the last thing that we did was take a look at the compression strut, which was basically the contribution of the insulation being um, crushed, per se. It's, a, it's sort of the resistance of the insulation to it. The other thing that we did was did a long-term exposure testing. And you can see these are basically different amounts of loading. The lighter weights, obviously, is the lighter weight, uh, loading, middle weight, heavier weight. We had four panels. I think that we ended up building last one's not built yet. There for XPS, EPS, polyiso, and mineral fiber insulation. And then they covered them with these panels just so that they didn't get rained on. Um, and we left them out in a in a field and I think for about two years or so, and kept per periodically coming back and, and measuring the deflection. Um, so what we found is that for the lower Plattings or the lighter weight plattings uh, are one sixteenth of an inch deflection. We were we were really stable. These things really didn't move at all. One thirty second of an inch. As we got into the mid weight plattings, this would be more like a, a stucco type weight. We were still pretty close, though it did seem like we might be getting a little bit of creep up near the end. What's the top line there? Uh, top one. Is I'm trying to remember. That, that was the EPS insulation. Oh, different insulation. Yeah, and I think there was there was something about that. I can't remember now, um, but there was something that went awry with that one. And then for the heavyweight plotting, uh, we decided well that was that was too much, and we just started started going off in a quarter of an inch, and it was it was still going. The last thing that I thought that was one of the more interesting things we found was that we decided to, to monitor this over the course of just one day, or I think or maybe it was a couple of days. And we found that there was actually more movement um, diurnally. So just from like the expansion and contraction, thermal expansion and contraction, the, the assemblies would kind of sag and then go back up and, and go down. So they, they actually moved up and down, not just down. So here's the, the results of all, all of this study. Um, really what it, what it boils down to is that, let me go to the next slide here. When we got to the lighter weight cladings, we felt very comfortable that even up to four inches of insulation, we had no problems with, with attaching it to furring strips. Um, over top, it was only once we started getting into heavier weight cladings that we started seeing that this might be a bit more of a concern. Part of the way to address that was to increase the, the fastener spacing, so because we did know that it had a direct correlation to the number of fasteners. Um, a lot of this research and stuff has now gone in. We worked with Naserta and Jay Crandall, and there are code provisions now in the building code. I unfortunately didn't bring up the. the 
the references, but you can find them where it does have specific information there that allows you to attach claddings directly either through insulation or to furring strips installed through the insulation for stud walls, for metal stud walls, different types of furring strips, different fastener types. So those provisions are in the code. If you want to look them up. Um, and yeah, hey, uh, since, since you mentioned them, uh, Jake Randall actually has a great uh, one pager on this uh, at continuousinsulation.org. So it's a it's a great quick guide for the cladding attachments. Awesome. All right. So now we're getting to the last part here. Um, I don't look in this photo anyway. I don't look nearly as young as I did when I first came to that session. <laughs> Uh, but now the, the work that I was doing is starting to shift a little bit away from doing the research and we were doing a lot more building uh, design reviews, commissioning, um, working with the designers to, to help uh, with their building projects. Uh, so uh, switching a little bit back to the exterior commercial application, one of the, um, what I'm going to go through, there's a, a few kind of generic what I would call the generic types of, uh, that we can do exterior insulation on buildings. This is probably the most common or the most versatile is just having discrete components for doing the insulation and the cladding. Um, another option is using an EIFS system to the exterior. And this Using insulated metal panels is another option. And I think there are some market places for it. Um, and they've actually gone and done some interesting things where they're using the insulated metal panel as a backup wall and providing additional cladding over top of it. So you can, you don't have to use the insulated metal panel as the final finish. You can dress it up however you want, uh, which I think is actually very interesting to me. This is, very similar to using like precast concrete where you have panels, you come and you hang them off the outside of the building. Um, but these are gonna be a lot better in terms of the um, <clears throat> insulation levels. Yeah. Have you guys luck with using these for buildings that require a really air or watertight enclosure? Because we found when we test these, they, they, they always fail, the joints, all sorts of things. Gaskets have to be right. The yep, they're they're definitely more problematic that way. Um, one of the things what I was alluding to about using this as a backup wall, when you do that, you actually can treat the joints. Um, yeah. You can yeah. just seal up all the joints and then you cloud over it. So you what, can, you what can about, get by that. If you want the metal panel appearance, what about putting an air and water barrier behind it? <laughs> so this was another option that that has been done as well. Um, I've seen I've actually seen more designs going this route where people are feeling that they'd rather just use it as like an insulated cladding system. But there are some tricks and, and detailing hoops that you got to go through with that. Let me ask you one question then. So I'm mm -hmm. doing this on two projects. Uh, you have a drainage space behind it, like a quarter inch. Mm -hmm. And they and you have weeps at the bottom so that water can get out. That uh, uh, my impression is that that doesn't affect the thermal performance radically. No. So what you want to do sure. is you, 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 ask your yeah. So the the idea is that you want to be able to provide drainage for the assembly, but you're not really wanting to provide back ventilation because you don't want to be um, bypassing the insulation with air currents and con convective currents of of air going through it. Um, so by putting drainage at the bottom and then capping the, and sealing the top, you can avoid sometimes just having that, that convective loop that's able to go through it. I don't think it's a perfect system, um, but you know, if, if you're getting, um, that's smart. if you can get that insulation sandwiched in there, uh, I think it's fairly, probably fairly similar than to just having um, like mineral wool on the outside of, of a building in terms of any kind of air bypass. And you wouldn't necessarily have the same exact amount of drainage, but, you know, hopefully that there's enough free draining through the mineral wool insulation that it wouldn't be accumulating. Okay, so just kind of stepping through, this is through the, for the first assembly, which is just a, a fairly standard wall air barrier, exterior insulation, and then some sort of cladding. One of the most 
common ones historically has been a brick veneer and doing exterior insulation behind brick veneers has actually been done a lot longer than anything else. Um, it's really easy to do. Um, but the detailing in terms of thermal bridging is not always very well done. So classic example of a masonry veneer wall, you know, this exposed slab edge, steel lintel, it's a very, very poorly performing wall from a thermal bridging perspective. Now, putting the exterior insulation on that, it's a step in the right direction. But this giant steel lintel that's coming through here, the amount of conduction that goes through that is just really killing the efficiency of it. So providing the steel lintel on some sort of standoff to reduce the amount of thermal bridging through the insulation is really where, where you want to go. So here's a, another example of that detail. Um, here's some photos of some standoffs that I've seen. These are welded to the gusset plates that allow enough space for them to get the insulation beyond there. Uh, this was a, a company called Ferro that a long time ago developed these. Kind of, I, I think they're really clever. You, you install a mounting bracket to the wall, and then the steel lintel just gets kind of flipped in. But it had different the sizes of those brackets to accommodate for different thicknesses of insulation. Um, these support details can also be extended to balconies and decks and canopies. So there's no reason why you could have a precast balcony that's also brought off of this. We don't have to necessarily cantilever or tie, tie everything directly back to the, the primary structure. So here's some balconies that look like they would be that the classic just exposed or extended slab edge. But when you looked in closer, they were actually held off the building with brackets so that the insulation could be run continuous past it. <clears throat> so we were talking about uh, other cladding systems. This is sort of reiterating what I was saying before. If you're if you only have an inch and a half, we can probably just act anchor right through it. Once we go beyond two inches, you'll need a secondary cladding support system to anchor to. For the lightweight claddings, um, this was a little bit less common, having put putting lighter weight claddings outside of um, the insulation on some sort of cladding attachment system. So there was a lot of questions about how to get this done. And the support systems were historically very poorly done, and but they're getting better. Oops, I go. I know. Okay, so this is the classic. The single Z furring through the insulation in order to pick up the cladding. I think we it it it, it shouldn't be done. So here's a picture of it. The reason why we're putting insulation on the exterior of the building is to, in a lot of cases for commercial construction, is to deal with the thermal bridging of all the steel studs because we knew that steel studs were so highly conductive that it just trashed the insulating value of the wall assembly. So if you put, imagine this is you're looking up the wall at a steel stud building. Like, what have you done? You've, you've changed nothing. All you've done is added a ton of cost to the project and improved nothing. That's so the it, bridge alignments with the stud, right? Well, it doesn't matter. Well, if because, you go across, if you go horizontal, you you only have one point of contact. Yeah, but you're you're bridging, you're you're still fully bridging that layer of insulation. So it doesn't matter. The whole point of trying to put that insulation, particularly if you did this with no cavity insulation. And you're just moving the insulation to the exterior because they said exterior insulation was the better way of doing this. You've just built a stud wall outside of your stud wall and put the insulation outside of that. So thermally, you might as well just jettison this whole thing, put the insulation back in the stud wall and, and call it a day. Save yourself a bunch of money. Um, the double Z furring, which is an improvement to this. However, this, don't confuse it, is a single Z furring with another Z furring across the front face of it. It's double, but it's not. 
because it's not in the insulation. It actually has to be buried. The two have to be buried within the insulation. Unfortunately, what ends up happening with this is that the cost starts going way up on this because now not only do you have all these the extra labor of putting up the double studs, but you also have two layers of insulation that they have to put in. So there's just a lot more labor that goes into it. There are FRP uh, zingers. Yeah, getting to it. <laughs> so um, the next one would be doing like a clip system uh, with a hat channel on the outside. This is what we're now starting to see finally in the industry becoming more common. I've spent a lot of years arguing with builders and we would we would put it in the drawings. It had to be a thermally broken, you know, cladding attachment system. And then I go away, the builder puts in their exclusions or, you know, whatever, I can't remember what the, the word that they use to Qualifications, thank you. They put in their qualifications that we're going to do continuous Z-Gerts and then we get to construction submittals and I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. They're like, oh no, it was in our qualifications. I'm like, you just destroyed the project. <laughs> like you, you've undone it. But now, I and I think it's a code requirement. Somebody can maybe back me up on this, but I think the code's gotten better in the IECC where it's flagged the continuous z -gert as being like a not acceptable thing to do and that you do need to use a, a thermally improved um, cladding support system. And I'm guessing that's the case because all of a sudden I'm no longer seeing a lot of continuous Z-Gerts and we're seeing like the green girt system and uh, the night wall system and Cascadia clips and these types of- Armatherm. What's fun? Armatherm. Armatherm. All right, so the next one is EIFS. I don't care what the history is. If you've got a drained EIFS system on your building, it is fantastic. If you wanna talk about low thermal bridging or no thermal bridging, lightweight, you can put a ton of insulation on the outside and the water management is very good now. It has a bad rap. There's a ton of insurance companies that still, as soon as they see it, they 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 freak out and won't touch it. But from a building physics perspective, an EIFS cladding is is actually a really really great cladding. Now, I there could be aesthetic concerns. I think the impact stuff has actually largely been dealt with. A lot of manufacturers now have their impact resistant coatings or ways of dealing with that that aspect of it. Um, what's interesting is it is a drain cladding and it is a rain screen cladding. It's a very small gap, but what they do is they use vertical bands of adhesive to stick the EPS boards up to, or they'll have roofs in the back of the EPS boards. And that ver those vertical bands of adhesive, when they squish the board in, they can't squish it fully tight, so it does leave a small gap, about a sixteenth of an inch. Obviously too small to get a penny behind, but from research, we know that that is going to let water out just fine. Um, it's also great for overcladding on mass, mass masonry buildings. Uh, easy to do because you don't have to worry about anchoring into the building. There isn't the worry of, of the structural aspects of those anchors. Um, you basically just glue it on, coat the building with a water control layer glue it on um it's been it's been used i think very successfully in a lot of reclad now we've got the insulated metal panels um these ones are pretty good they're very actually pretty lightweight all things considered and from a thickness and per r value perspective you can get a lot of r value out of these so i think that they do uh have some benefits from that aspect but as you alluded to some of the detailing can be tricky. Um, the window flashing detailing, the through wall flashing detailing. And I think a lot of that has been um, why a lot of people have used them more as an insulated cladding instead of uh, an insulated, like a full sealed wall panel. So this is for the option to insulated cladding. Uh, 
Um, this was just talking about some some things that may come up if you're using this on the outside of the building. Uh, fire containment is is one of the aspects that does need to be addressed in the construction. Uh, maybe not so hard in new construction, but could be problematic as if it's used as an overclad. <laughs> so it's just like a, an FDA 285 deal? Like, oh, the NFPA 285? Yeah. Uh, I, I was thinking of it more from a typical architectural, like fire smokes, smoke seal at the floor lines. It so, would be because there's combustibles in the in the wall assembly, so it absolutely would. Most of them have been tested for 285. Yeah. That's one of the first things they have to do to be in business. Yeah. So this is just talking a little bit about what, what we had already discussed about the insulation. Um, to to be able to fill in the back side of the panel to avoid the, the bridging. And this to me simplifies a lot of the details such as balcony interfaces, lower roofs and the core panelization. Uh, this is a couple of photos just at the end here showing uh, the retrofit we did oh, quite a while ago now, um, Castle Square here in Boston. You can see the insulated metal panel was being used, but we also had the insulation um, behind it on the furring strips. Okay. So the main thing for me, the main takeaways for here is that we've got a lot of options um, for exterior insulation on buildings. I think there's a lot of design options out there for you. The issues with thermal bridging, which is I think has been one of the main problems or main uh, stumbling blocks for this is really starting to get better understood. And I'm starting to see a lot better details um, in, in recent construction to improve it. Um, the other thing that I, I think is very interesting for me is that I'm starting to see exterior insulation in other climate zones. This has been for a long time, uh, cold climate, Northeast Canada thing. As soon as I got out of Massachusetts, even as you know, New York, DC, it, it wasn't there. But now it's starting to, to show up. I have actually a project in well, two projects, one in Houston and one in Dallas, where they need to put exterior insulation on the building. And they are freaking out. They just, <laughs> they have no idea how to do it. They've submitted to me z three times. I keep telling them no, getting on my soapbox on why they can't do it. Um, so it's it's interesting. And it's I think it's uh, very encouraging that um, it's becoming much more commonplace in, in construction. Um, and definitely with like Casa House, it's, it's something that's going to be needed. Uh, so we we'll want to just keep moving it forward. For our, uh, <clears throat> our insulated product, Texas and Florida, were the two, um, your, your biggest world in our case for us for insulated product. Yeah, I can see pretty, that. Pretty interesting for that point. How does the science change when you get into cooling climates like Florida or Texas? Uh, it's, I mean, well, it does. It, 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 right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, having as I don't, I don't but um, as he was saying earlier, in a inward vapor drive, having impermeable insulation and impermeable air barrier on the outside of the building would be the benefit um, if you wanted to do that. We're, you know, in our view, a lot of the things is more about making sure you don't put impermeable coatings on the interior of the wall in the cooling climate to allow wall assemblies to and the you know air conditioning to just deal with the dehumidification that that you need. Um, that's been more of the issue. Uh, from you obviously won't have like a condensation problem on the interior surface in a, in a cooling dominated climate, though there are a lot of swing climate. So even a place like Dallas, which seems like it should be a hot climate, has significant amounts of the year that it's got pretty cold temperatures and condensation is still a concern there. So I'm okay. going to say thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, we do have time for questions. Yeah. I did want to bring up the, the chat room, though, just so we can have some of the folks online ask questions here as well. Some of them have come in as you've been speaking, so I just brought it up here. Um, some you've kind of addressed a little bit already, mm -hmm. um, but maybe if you kind of read through here and see some that kind of stick out here that we can address right now. 
Um, but to everyone else, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. We'll get some of your questions too if we have them. Yes, I see I see Mark is there. Uh, I saw him. <laughs> yeah. I saw him doing it and made me nervous. Like, oh, um, but thank you, Mark, for letting us know. He's got a comment saying that uh, new code for commercial buildings under 20,000 square feet requires actual new values that account for thermal bridging. Yeah, and which is good. The second part says he's referring to the stretch code, so that's in the stretch code. Yeah. Um, okay, so how do the green dirts compare to flip hi hat system? Um, for me, I think it's I don't really have a, a preference for them. Um, I think it's up to up to the designer, and, and a lot of it comes to the installer. A lot of times, the flip and attachment system is going to be part of the cladding um, subcontractor's scope. And so depending on what they would like to use, um, it's it's okay with me. Let's see. Do you need to provide a space for drainage between a permeable WRV and XPS over plywood or will drainage happen even without an intentional spacer? Um, that's a good question. I think that ge generally what we found is that the drainage will still happen. Most of the, most of the materials that get installed Usually, there's enough construction variation that you don't have as tight of um, a, a seal there. Uh, and for the most part, like I'm, you know, from a from an exterior water management perspective, the the way the a cladding functions and and the water sort of uh, reduces as you're going through the assembly. I'm very Unconcerned about water between the insulation and the WRB for the most part. I mean, most of the water in a in a properly designed rain screen, most of it sheds off the front surface. What gets through a lot of it will actually cling to the back side of the cladding and shed down. If it does get across the gap to the insulation, then the next amount is going to be shedding down the face of the insulation. And it takes quite a bit for it to finally migrate its way all the way to the back side. Now, I say that as a general rule. However, if you have a detail like a, a flashing that's, you know, a through wall flashing that's back pitched and directed to a corner, all bets are off. You could be dumping all of your water under there, but that, you know, flashing detailing and that kind of water management is a whole other discussion. Um, any other questions here in the room? There's sign in sheet for AIA. Uh, yeah, so actually over on that table right over there, they have an online form. You got to scan a, a QR code there. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I actually do have a question. Uh, that's just, I was wondering, you are um, a representative of the r and yes, right? Are. You, okay. So that's a very popular product mm -hmm. because it's inexpensive. Yeah. And now with more, like, you know, those assemblies that are high performing being specified, you have that r -zip proposed and popular, like, you know, houses or um, even multifamily. And then how that like water management actually happens in that wall assembly, you have your stud, your actual structural sheeting, and then you have that R zip with less permeable um sheeting there attached to it. Yeah. It really confuses me. And I kind of worry that like, you know, we are pushing this like a change with the passive house with like stretch code and all, but like when it gets filled and with all good intentions, how that actually will work. So with a zip arch sheathing, the water control layer really should be at the front face of the panel. That's how that's designed. Um, you know, in, in terms of the general condensation control, you are actually fairly well protected because of the fact that as long as you have enough of it to the outside, so mm -hmm. sort of back to that ratio table yeah. that I was talking about. Um, but in terms of general diffusion or air leakage hitting the backside, of the zip R sheathing, um, then it would be, you know, if it's warm enough, it's not going to condense. And we're all we're all fine. The only place that I see that there could be some issues with it, though I think the risk is still fairly low, because uh, I believe we probably have enough capacity, is at the panel joints. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that's happened. I didn't touch on um, SIP panels on this, but one concern that it's always happened with SIP panels in cold climates. Um, and actually, maybe you can speak to like how permeable the zip tape is. Is it permeable? Not very, not, not a very. lot of permeating along. Okay. But now I would 
If you're looking for something more permeable, like a liquid flashing, or we have a vapor permeable zip tape. Okay. So something like a vapor permeable zip tape would mitigate some of that concern as that it would allow that joint to dry out to the outside. Yes. Well, one strategy could be to use two layers, like a base layer of polyiso, um, and then you stagger and offset that seam with a zip R product. So then you don't have that one path of that, that thermal. Yep. Right no, you ab absolutely could build it out more. Um, another problem we saw with the zip is that the tapes, it's the horizontal edges, top edges of, of the horizontal tapes isn't caulked. They, if you, you get a well, you, you, you got to talk to this yeah. guy. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. That's, that's a, there, I mean, yes, listen, there are, there are risks of almost any assembly. There's nothing out there that's foolproof. I've seen people mess up everything out there. So, um, yes, it can, it, it can be problematic. Uh, but you know, it's sort of like my, always my counter argument to deal with a lot of like higher end architects and they, they come, you know, Oh, Hivec, I would never use Hivec on my buildings. It's garbage. I'm like, well, guess what? There are thousands, if not millions of buildings built with Hivec and they're functioning just fine. Like right. if you detail it properly, it actually can work quite well. Now I have my own personal, you know, kind of limitations on exposure, like I think Tyvek is good up to about six or seven stories, but on a 25 to 40 story high rise, I generally would inspect that. I would go to a fluid applied or a sheet applied membrane, something like that. So, you know, that's, there are those, those things, but I think that, you know, detailing is paramount and it's actually probably more important a lot of times than the choice of the materials that you're using. So I would just say to add on to that too, like once, you get the detailing piece and then you've got the actual on-site work. And I would just add that if it's a good manufacturer that you're working with in that space, you should follow up with them on pre-construction meetings, site inspections. Yeah. So they're kind of helping you. I mean, that's part of what I do is help kind of babysit the job a little bit and yeah. make sure that the plans are actually coming to life. So I see a hand here and we'll go. That'll be the final question and we'll wrap it up. Might be a can of worms. <laughs> oh, that's a good one for the last one, I guess. <laughs> so one of the things that we're dealing with a lot with the stretch code and updates is a lot of retrofit applications. Mm -hmm. And in this area, we have a ton of masonry. We've got mm -hmm. a ton of the, you know, concrete or brick. And as far as getting your continuous insulation, you can't always get it on the outside, especially if it's historic. I mean, everything downtown, you basically can't over -add. So right. yeah. it's like, it's a big You need question. to talk to Coda. Coda's <laughs> Coda's the masonry guru. He's done uh, a lot of work on on that. Um, but you're right. I mean, this this was focused on exterior insulation applications, and that really is a interior insulation application. Yeah, and well, it's. I mean, if you've got a concrete floor that's set into a mass masonry wall, I GTI camera out the floor. Like, I mean. I don't know. <laughs> you could. I mean, it's, <laughs> I guess the, you know, one of the things that I think is important, or at least that I'm, you know, when I'm looking at buildings and I'm looking at, um, you know, projects in general is what, like, what can you do? Like, I, you know, it's like that to me, that's an example of, well, that could be a showstopper for the project, mm -hmm. right? So like, you're not going to do anything because you get, you, you're trying to get everything. So Maybe you don't always have to get everything as long as you can get a lot of what you want to get done. Um, but it, to me, it's also like the opportunities, right? Like the thing that's driving me the most crazy right now is when I see a building getting reclad. And, you know, a lot of residential houses getting reclad. My neighbor just did it. And they strip off the, the cladding and they put new cladding back up. And I'm like, you have one opportunity <laughs> probably for the next 50 to 100 years <laughs> to increase the thermal performance of that wall when you pulled off that cladding and you didn't do it because of probably the you know ten thousand dollar upcharge that you're going to need to incur and uh, i'm not going to blend this necessarily on the homeowners or anybody else um specifically as i think as an industry we need to move there but I've been trying to get my house reclad. And as soon as I mention insulation on the outside, 
you should see the contractors run. Like they don't want to touch it. I had one guy told me flat out, he's like, I won't do it. <laughs> Other guys, they just give me the, you know, well inflated cost. <laughs> you know, like, I'm sorry, I've, I've got a, you know, a 1200 square foot box of a house that I live in, two stories. And they were quoting me like $80,000. And I'm like, what? So I, we, there, is, there is an issue there. But like one of the things I think for projects is evaluating and looking at it and making sure that the, the right opportunities are being taken and you're not missing the opportunities when they're presented. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.